Yeah, the cat's kind of an asshole. Hence, he's just moving dice all around the table right now. And he absolutely ate through the cord for my microphone. Oh, no! Yeah. Little rat bastard. <sighs> Alright, you ready? Never. Welcome to Booked All Night, a late night podcast about young adult literature and sometimes middle grade because middle grade is always super fun. Hosted mm-hmm. by myself, Jessica Tuckerman, and Magdalene Ann. Hi. Fair warnings include language, spoilers, and rude ass pets. Like the cat, but also looking at you, Luca Bear. <laughs> <laughs> Be sure to subscribe to Booked All Night on Spotify, Google Podcasts, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast fix. And leave a nice soul five-star review of the show before you go. Then make sure to visit bookedallnight.blog for more book reviews, blog tours, roundups, and to sign up for our newsletter that Maggie occasionally sends out. <laughs> I'll remember to send that at some point. On... Tonight's episode, we're discussing George Lucas as a genre of fiction. Yay! <laughs> and genres of fiction in general. We are recording on April 27th, 2019. Let's get started. So, I just want to start with, uh, like, what are you currently reading? Uh, currently... I am listening to uh, Maureen Johnson's The Vanishing Stair. It's a sequel to her truly devious mystery novel. It's very good. Oh, good. The narrator is amazing. Um, and I was listening to like the last hour and a half in the, in the car <laughs> as I was driving down here. And I am just itching to get back to it because some, some shit has just happened. Oh, but that's like, that's the mark of the best kind of story. <laughs> because, so I... I tried to get into Mortal Engines. Uh, yeah, Mortal Engines. Thank you, computer. Did you know that Maggie's coming down for a visit for podcasting? That's uh, why so I muted mine. <laughs> I should probably also mute my phone. Uh, it's probably a good plan. Why don't I go ahead and do that? Look at that. All fixed now. Um, so I've been trying to get into Mortal Engines, but mm-hmm. I just... Like, the narrator's fine, because I'm, I'm doing the audiobook. It's easier right. to read at work when I have an audiobook. Oh, yeah, same, same. Not, didn't mm-hmm. really enjoy it. And then I, I picked up the audiobook for Warstorm mm. because I'm like, it's high time that I finished this yeah. series. And and I believe you also put it down because it was just like, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, part of it was also that it had been so long since I read the rest of the series. So I, I already felt like out of it and then just like I couldn't get back into it. And mm-hmm. I think... I think too. Not only not only time. There was a lot more time between King's Cage and Warstorm, yeah. but we were also finishing our MFA, as I mentioned on every podcast. But you know, that's ten books a month, a hundred books a semester. Like yeah. it, we had no time for a nine hundred page book that just was not moving. Well, that. But also, there's you know nine hundred books in between that mm-hmm. and the other True. books. So yeah. it was. It feels a lot longer. But I am actually currently reading. Mm-hmm. Uh, testimony from yes. your perfect girl, which we got from our favorite marketing professional, <laughs> uh, Tessa, up at who deserves Pen- every cake. Yeah, all the cake uh, <laughs> up at Penguin Random House, mm-hmm. uh, and it's by Cowie Hart Hemmings. And actually, I was looking her up. So she's got um, the Descendants, which is more middle grade and mm-hmm. YA, but her other books look to be adult fiction. So I'm actually really eager to see how this holds up because mm-hmm. a lot of authors who kind of cross between those. Like the big kid age gap and the little kid age gap. Yeah, they they tend to have some weird crossover language. Mm-hmm. But so far, I mean, like you can see, I'm four chapters into it. Oh, like you're annotating. Yeah, and I'm annotating. <laughs> um, it's also interesting because it's contemporary, isn't it? We're neither, neither neither of us are fans of contemporary. It's true, but I I actually so. I'm deciding to give contemporary a chance, mm-hmm. not only because it's being shoved down my fucking throat, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, I, I've kind of pigeonholed myself in, in my genre that, you know, like, I very restrictively read science fiction fantasies, mm-hmm. so I'm like, okay, every everything feels like a trope at this point, right. whether or not it actually is, and right. so I'm like, well, I'll, I'll just go read something that's not my usual thing and see mm-hmm. how that works. Yeah. And that has actually worked for me in the past. Uh, I read... Stacy Cade's For This Life Only. Oh, I remember. I remember you yeah. loving it. That was the only one that you cried during. Yeah, I like had actual feelings during it, as <laughs> as we all know. I don't normally do. That dog is taking a poop outside my window. <laughs> all right. You go. You go, buddy. Good boy. Good right. boy. Making a boom boom. Someone picks up that poop because there's people in my neighborhood who don't. <laughs> 
Uh, and do you have anything coming up next on your TBR? Um, I have a cat on your computer. Cat on my computer. Oh, I thank you. My eyes for a hot. Welcome back to re-recording because when I went to go delete what the cat typed up in our notes document, oh, I God. accidentally uh, stopped our podcast recording. So I'm just going to move my mouse over here now. Oh no! How much of it did it stop recording? Was oh it all no, of it? no, only like just what you had. Oh, I believe yeah. that too. <laughs> okay, what were we talking about? We were talking about what's oh, next up next on the TBR. TBR. Uh, I actually have. The second book of Amy Kaufman's Elemental series, oh. Scorch Dragons. It literally, like, I processed this last week at work, and I was like, huh, this is, I'm going to take this. I do feel like That's... you're, you cheat a little with your TBR oh. being a librarian. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I am very fortunate to be able to be the first <laughs> one to get the book whenever it comes in. Like, there was, um... A book that was processed literally on Thursday. It was a graphic novel called Pilu in the Woods. Super cute. Very nice art style. It was about uh, a girl who loses her mom and then uh, comes around to, you know, through the works through the grief by finding a forest spirit and all that. It was very interesting. Um, and um, uh, literally... I was processing, and I was like, oh, this looks really cute. I'm going to check this out to myself. Into my <laughs> <laughs> I used to do that when I was when I was interning. I'm like, oh, wow, what a cute book. And they were always like, yeah, like if you want to take a copy home, go ahead, because, mm -hmm. you know, we print hundreds of, yeah. of ARCs. I'm like, sweet! So I have all these ARCs. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's the only thing that's on my to-read right now, is mm -hmm. just arcs i have mm -hmm. uh the next phoebe and her unicorn book. Oh, i know you yeah, love that one i do love those they're <laughs> they're little girl calvin and Hobbes, and oh. and i love it i love it so much i <laughs> what else do i have i have an audiobook of the cruel prince waiting for me in my libby app that's holly black i believe because mm -hmm. i keep hearing about it and i didn't want to pay for it so i just got uh the audiobook from libby i did pick up what else did i pick up I have so what I'm putting down. No. <laughs> <laughs> so recently, um, my boyfriend was over and he looked at my very large library collection in my room where I have just, you know, four and a half shelves of books. And he was like, I'm really curious as to how many of these books you've actually read because we were having a discussion about how many books I have, how I need new shelves and all that stuff. Uh, and so he took to counting all of the books that are on my shelf, including all of my school books, craft books, nonfiction books, uh, and all of the stuff that I've uh, garnered over the years. Okay, but craft books don't really count as like books they that don't. you've read because you, you're not supposed to read yeah, them we, cover to we, cover. We weren't counting my nonfiction shelf, but like he, he still like counted all of them. Uh, and I counted all the ones that I have actually read that are on that shelf. Uh, out of the 443 books that I own, I read 78. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very bad with my TBR mountain. <laughs> <laughs> mountain? You got a fucking planet. Like, <laughs> like a whole planet. <laughs> I'm bigger than Pluto. Jesus. You know, it. <laughs> no, like my... I have the same issue, but my library these days mm -hmm. is digital. Mm -hmm. So it's not taking up all of this space, which is part of the reason that I, I like... I mean, I love my Kindle and, mm -hmm. and just e-reading in general because it doesn't take up mm -hmm. all that space. I never have to worry about needing more shelves. <laughs> uh, and I don't have to pack up my digital library because it fits in my pocket. I mean, that's fair. And I I definitely agree with that. I do like Kindle books, too. I definitely have a lot of those, lot of those too. as well. I haven't counted those. But these are just the physical books because I also like the physical books. Like, yeah. Uh, I specifically got a bigger purse so I can carry more books in my purse. <laughs> that's the, got, it's the only reason there. to have a purse is to carry oh, yeah. books in it. Otherwise, <laughs> you could just carry your wallet around. Yeah. Um, so, getting into the discussion. Right. So and George I, Lucas is a genre of fiction. So, also J.K. Rowling. Also J.K. Rowling. But I, I feel like there's, there's two different ways, right? Mm -hmm. So, George Lucas constantly expands it and is just like merchandise and merchandise and merchandise but jk rowling is like retconning 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 and it's just like information that we don't need at this point and if you want to create new material create new material mm. not giving us like 
extra side notes on mm-hmm. your old material. Blah, 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 blah. Like, if I wanted side notes on the original material, I could just go to fanfiction.net. And, and that's, like... I think that's a big point, mm-hmm. too, is that a lot of it now just kind of feels like J.K. Rowling's fanfiction for her own work. Yeah. And I, my favorite is the um, the cell phone game, right? J.K. J.K. Rowling revealed, and then you just use your... Your, your, your um... Prediction text? Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. so let's see. J.K. Rowling revealed to me, and I will be there at the same time as the other <laughs> one, is a little more than I can say. So that whole thing is, J.K. Rowling revealed to me, and I will be there at the same time as the other one is a little more than I can say. <laughs> J.K. Rowling revealed to me, and I will be there in your room, and I don't want to be in <laughs> your pocket. <laughs> I don't want to be in your pockets, Joanne. I don't want to be in your pocket. I sent you that text that uh, you have it for posterity. It's beautiful. <laughs> These are the texts I don't mind getting in the middle of the night. Unlike your well, meltdowns. You don't, you don't, you don't want to hear when I'm crying a lot about ships or people dying or whatnot. Or, or oh, what was the, what was the one uh, that you, you saved the screenshots of? Oh, it was Divergent. The, mm. the last book of Divergent that I was reading. Yes, when you screamed at me through text. Jessica! <laughs> Jessica, what the hell is just happening? <laughs> Jessica, Mary, you wake up! <laughs> Jessica! <laughs> Jessica! Oh, you scared the cat. Oh, well, the cat deserves it. He's an <laughs> asshole. Like I said, Sabat Tahir tweeted mm-hmm. recently, she's working on the next Ember in the Ashes book, mm-hmm. and she's like, titles! Titles! <laughs> what is this title? She, like, put up a bunch of joke titles, and I tweet at her. I'm like, why don't you let me read it? I'll help you title it. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, oh my god. <laughs> I'm not hearing it now. <laughs> um... But yeah, like, oh, so you and I were talking about it while I was at work. Ha 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 ha. But... I think I was also at work. You were probably also at work. We yeah. tend to do that. What is this cat doing to my shoes right now? Where? Underneath oh, me. Oh, under Anywho. you. You were looking at the walls. Like, how I, did he get on the wall? I, just, I, was, <laughs> I was very, very quizzical about what's happening to my feet at the moment. Anywho, uh, talking about genre and how a lot of, especially high fantasy, mm-hmm. I feel kind of suffers from the, it was supposed to be three books, now it's like six books. Mm-hmm. And just because I need the space and how that works in some genres and how it doesn't work in other genres and how no book anymore is really like one genre. Mm-hmm. And and I, I got there because I'm I'm going through a new craft book, which is the, the Now Write series. I don't usually pick these up all that often, but there's mm-hmm. um, essays and exercises for developing your stuff. So I picked one up recently about speculative fiction Mm -hmm. and in it there was one talking about uh, genre and picking your genre and sticking to elements of that genre and how, you know, of course there is no one genre, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just a fantasy novel. It's also adventure. There's also romance. There's always going to be mystery Mm -hmm. because otherwise why the hell am I turning the page if I already know everything? Right. And I really liked that because it also talked about when you're querying that you have one genre that's describing your plot and one Mm -hmm. genre that's describing your world. Mm -hmm. And I liked how that made that very succinct as opposed to like, well, I kind of have this like speculative, dystopian, sci-fi, little fantasy-esque kind of like, I I think pitching especially is very difficult for (laughs) Everybody. I, I don't think I've ever met anyone like, I know exactly how I'm going to pitch this novel. Like, no, you fucking don't, Stephen <laughs> King. Shut up. <laughs> uh, but that really kind of brought it down. And then I was thinking about that and we were talking about that. And that's how we got to talking about Warstorm and how mm-hmm. we were like, I thought it was supposed to originally be three books. Mm-hmm. And then, whoop, I need more space. Yeah. I mean, that's just happened a lot in fantasy. Like, um, uh, Aragon mm-hmm. was supposed to be a trilogy, became a quartet and then now there's a, a series of short stories yeah he just released um i also want to talk about series of short stories relating to the world because <laughs> i like george lucas as a genre anywho go on uh but like my all-time favorite series in the world by my all-time favorite author ever susan dennard who i never will stop praising my love of do you like susan dennard uh, do I? I didn't know uh but truth was she has never mentioned how long the series is going to be she specifically every time someone's like oh how many more books will there be she's like ah 
She, like she specifically is not cornering herself into a number of books and is just letting the story unfold naturally. I think because there's 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 a lot of plot planning that goes into writing a trilogy. That's like, probably I've, the smartest way to talk about your mm-hmm. your fantasy fantasy especially. Yes. Um, which like. I would say sci-fi and fantasy are two sides of the same coin mm-hmm. because we are, you say magic, I say yeah. technology. Like, yeah. it, we're not we're not different. Yeah. But science fiction, I think, can often draw on real world mm-hmm. terms where fantasy can't. And what we can, it just has to be veiled under the whole fantasy rainbow. Yes. Um, but... Flying cows. <laughs> <laughs> Jerky. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, this was a problem that I had when I was writing my fantasy series. Like, I was planning one, I was like plotting out one book, but I'm also thinking, I have to think of, you know, later down the line, like, how is this going to affect things in books two, three, four, whatever. And that was a lot of what kind of caused me to freeze up with that. Mm-hmm. And I ended up having to shelve it for an indeterminate amount of time. Um, but like, I think Suze's approach Suze's Suze 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 what she calls herself and what we call her uh Suze C-O-O-Z Suze like she 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 hasn't uh specifically mentioned how many books are in the series and from what I know from the newsletters she doesn't um she, she she's not revealing that she's just kind of letting it grow organically and I think that's what's needed in fantasy books but it's so hard because you sell x amount of books to the publisher yeah i all right so especially with the truth which series Mm -hmm. my question then is do you feel at the end of each novel that things have been wrapped up so for truth which yes that's a very it's a very standalone Mm -hmm. um, piece like i can very much just read truth which be done with it Mm -hmm. Uh, wind which was a little more of a stepping stone type book so not entirely Mm -hmm. Uh, Sight, which was pretty standalone, uh, and Blood, which was pretty, pretty compact, pretty, pretty tied off in the end. But there's still, you know, um, you know, more questions to ask, but, you know, the questions that have been asked have been answered. See, I think then that that's, like, that's, that's the way to do it for such Mm -hmm. a long, a long series that you don't know, like, Mm -hmm. am I going to stop? Am I not going to blah, 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 blah. It's like she's braiding something and then, you know, you could stop here or you could just add some more rope. Yeah. Uh, I feel like Vaveyard adds a lot of rope. Mm. Um, the the short stories. The throne. And yeah, I just... Well, I'm pretty sure three out of the five stories in that collection were released in between the other books. So they're part of the the other collection that was released online then? Yes, I'm pretty sure. I haven't actually looked into Broken Throne. I don't think there were two new stories in there. Like half of them are previous stories or whatever. It was. I, I feel... I feel floppy on it because on one hand, like, I, I do believe in exploring your universe and putting more out there and giving more to your fans. Mm-hmm. But on the other side, I feel like this is too much. Let us just have that series and that story mm-hmm. and let it be what it is mm-hmm. rather than trying to George Lucas it. Yeah. Get a little more out of it because at, at this point, because of the series, mm-hmm. because, you know, Cal and Nathan and Mare's story is over. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feel like an expansion. It feels like a cash grab. Mm-hmm. And in that, yeah, I, like I'm already turned off because of the way that that feels to me. Rather than like, oh, hey, fans are still talking about this. Like, like Pottermore. Right? Pottermore mm-hmm. comes up. The series has been over for many, many years. Mm-hmm. And it was originally just like a new way to explore the same information. Then all of a sudden, she started adding new information. Mm-hmm. And that's when it was just like, no. Yeah. Like, knock it off. That reminds me, is tangentially related. <laughs> so there is... Magical jerky. <laughs> there is a new... I think I don't know if I told you this, but there's a new new librarian assistant that uh, joined the team about a month after I joined the team. And has never read he's, Harry Potter. He's, he's very sweet. He was homeschooled. He's 18. He has never read Harry Potter, never seen the movies, doesn't know a lick about the world. And he picked up Harry Potter for the first time at work Thursday night. Because we had not, we were done with all of our actual work and we had like an hour and a half to. He needs to around. experience the audiobooks because Jim Dale is that's amazing. That's what we said. That's what we said. Uh, <laughs> he was like, "Oh, I like I prefer audiobooks," and I'm like, "Well, yeah, pick up the audiobooks. They're great." Um, but he, he was really sweet. He was like, "So, so, so regular people are called muggles, and what is this? Who's 
Who's Hagrid? Hagrid. <laughs> <laughs> he, he had so many questions. It was very sweet. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> how did how did he pronounce Hermione's name? He hasn't gotten that far. He only read one chapter at work. Okay. He's a slow reader. Um, <laughs> I can't. Be, I I'm, can't I'm wait till he I'm discovers her. My one. Yes. <laughs> Or Hermione. Hermione. That's how I pronounced it. Hermione. Hermione. Um, but he, there was, there's so much to consume. All of the, the rest of us are Potterheads, so we were all like, oh, we wonder what house he's in, and we should probably stay away from Cursed Child, and we need you to take the quiz, and like, we're talking about all of this, and he's just like, I can see him getting overwhelmed. I'm like, okay, just stay, start with book one, and then we'll go from there. <laughs> so, okay. So, like, part Her of it is like, it's also. There's there's a line between providing more content for fans who want that content, mm -hmm. providing more content because your publisher demands of it, and then pub providing that content because you don't know how to stop. And there become there comes a point <laughs> where it, mm, there comes a point <laughs> when it just becomes so overwhelming. It's just a tidal wave of potential and like places to start he was so confused and i was just like this would have been so much simpler if there was the series and that's it yeah or you know we know there's potter more we know there's cursed child but like but i feel like here's Har the, all right so harry potter uh shadow hunters even i twilight's not really like an active fandom so much anymore. anymore um it had a bit of a bump when um Fifty Shades of Grey came back out. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. Uh, but no, I think uh, especially in these examples, you know, there's a fandom, mm -hmm. and it's it's not just like oh, there's a following, there's an interest, there are fans, there's a fandom. Mm -hmm. You know that that's so much different. There's so much culture there. There's so much that gets created mm -hmm. from the reader, from the consumer mm -hmm. that the author has no control over. So mm -hmm. that's like, and that's a really good point that you and your fellow librarians are like, Oh my God, I wonder what house he's in. Like mm -hmm. this is immediately that culture. Mm -hmm. It's not just from your first time reading. It's from growing up with it. Mm -hmm. It's from experiencing fandom. It's from just kind of being there and creating your own stories within that universe, mm -hmm. which I mean, great genre work does. Mm -hmm. but I have a smudge I'm sorry I have a smudge on my glasses it's not fucking going away and it just is right on top of your face oh good like in the glasses and I just keep looking at you but I keep looking at the smudge <laughs> and I'm getting so distracted are you I'm saying sorry. my face is a smudge Maggie yes Aww. right now yes because I can't see shit <laughs> Oh, you're a smudge, your wall's a smudge, your cat's a smudge, but, Actually, I can't see your cat. <laughs> but but as it relates back to, like, you know, the George Lucasing, which yeah. of course, like, you're, you're just taking too much, you're putting out too much, mm -hmm. you're asking for, like, too much money in return. Like, mm -hmm. instead of putting things out and hoping it sells, why don't you spend the time and create something? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Pottermore started that way, mm -hmm. where time was, like, there was time spent recreating these books so that we got to re-explore the story. Mm -hmm. But now with like all these illustrations and mm -hmm. things to find, I really loved like the seek and find element of it. I don't think that kind of interaction flies anymore. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's absolutely seen as okay, you want more money, you want more money, you want to keep my interest in this, but instead of remaining true to the source material, you're willing to just kind of bastardize everything mm -hmm. and do all these retcons. Like surprise Dumbledore was gay. Like mm -hmm. okay, like that's great, but like did it mm -hmm. did like it it was never it was never relevant to the story, so well, that was the whole the whole argument about it not being on the page, and that's a whole different can of worms to open up about the whole lack of representation and yeah. Mm, and I don't have the spoons to go and, into that today. Well, like just very briefly for lack of representation and it not being on the page, mm. like that's that's what I mean. Where you're creating material out of a response to something rather than because the material is mm. relevant. To mm -hmm. the story or because you can like mm -hmm. i have the the new character and she's bi you love her she's mm -hmm. adorable right and and that's it she's just got a couple lines at the beginning and she's like hey that girl's hot mm -hmm. he's hot too and like we're moving on because her sexuality is never going to be that but she is representation on the page mm -hmm. but to be like, like if i put it out and it got published and then i was like oh by the way my character's bi like that's a completely different kind of half-assed representation mm -hmm. like um wings and rowan Mm. where all of a sudden at the end she's like oh I've kept this secret for like 500 years mm. like but 
but it doesn't feel that way. Mm. And like, I, my, I don't care that you are. But I care mm. about the way that this was revealed. Because mm-hmm. she mm-hmm. might as well have just made a Twitter account for more and be like, surprise! Yep. <laughs> yep. I, yep. She JK Rowling did. Yes. So, like, where George Lucas is like, my fandom is active and I want to uh, take more from them. I feel like JK Rowling is like, I want to appease you with mm. fact vomit. <laughs> That's what it's become. Fact vomit. Yes. Hi, cat. You found the Kit Kat's cat? Yes. Mr. Plumpkin Obadiah is going to chew on my computer. Stop that. No. Stop chewing on my computer. Uh, but it's just, it's just really weird because I don't feel like I see this in contemporary fiction. I mm-hmm. never see this in, like, adult literary fiction. Mm-hmm. I can't actually think of an adult series Give me a outside of, like, Lord of the Rings, yeah. which I like, I cannot count for the sake of this argument. But is there something where an author has all this extra material where this is okay now, today, in 2019, to then put out all over the place? Mm. Oh, Game of Thrones. Kyle comes in, yes. <laughs> but does but does George R. R. Martin like sit out there and tweet that you know like oh surprise this character actually did this or does he include that in his source no, material? Don't eat. Don't eat shit. Uh, this or that? Yes and no. Um, uh, like he doesn't. I mean, the guy only is on live. So yes, he's he's keeping live journal alive. He has. Uh, like what are you he, eating, Cat? Just... Stop eating. Like Stop eating the paper. Get instead of releasing the, na- the next main book in the series, he's, he released a book on the Targaryen house. Mm-hmm. And then there's the book of the World of Ice and Fire that you bought me a few years for Christmas. That's just the history. It's just his history notes compiled. And then there's all, so that's world building, and then the Targaryen book is world building, and then uh, he released a cookbook. The cookbook of Ice and Fire. He released it. I didn't know that he released a cookbook. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's mostly based off of the show. Honestly. Stop eating my laptop, cat! Like, he's, uh, he's kind of, like, instead of actually finishing Winds of Winter, he's just been, like, pumping out all this side content. And it's been a little, like, it's like, oh, this is nice, this is a little nice. So he started, he started with a little George Lucas because he had the, the world notes and they were going out. But then he J.K. rolling it. Well, he, I mean, he. Because he put out a cook. Stop eating my laptop! I would not say he J.K. rowling it because he never really, he did not J.K. Rowling it. Because he didn't, like, he didn't come out and was like, oh, by the way, uh, this character is you know, gay as sin. <laughs> never mentioned it. You know, like one of the one of the examples is, is like the book versus the show does it more than the book because mm-hmm. like in mm-hmm. the book Renly Baratheon is hinted at being homosexual and it's like you know like so he never like he never beds his wife you know he gets married to one of the Tyrells he never beds his wife and like it's mentioned kind of every now and then and you kind of got to read between the lines and whatnot meanwhile in the show he just straight up gets a blowy from a dude like. There's no way fans or butts about it, you know, so... I feel like there might be some butts about it later. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But, so, like, the show kind of, like, the, sh- the the books that he's releasing are kind of George Lucas in the sense that he's just expanding on his own universe, whereas the show is kind of J.K. Rowling it, where it's... Where you're creating like, some retcon for some... Well, it's not really creating retcon per se, but it's definitely just, like, it's taking away the mystery from the novels. It's yeah. Taking, it's, take, it's, like, taking away the intelligence of the reader and yes. just like sticking it in your face. Yeah. So like there's no whereas like J.K. Rowling never put anything in the books to hint that Dumbledore was gay until she gave that interview a month after the seventh one came out. Yeah. George R. R. Martin, like if you go back and read those like how he wrote Renly in those specific scenes and what he was doing, especially in the context of um who is especially in the context of him writing it as it's middle English. Mm-hmm. So like you have, like pay attention to like the social the societal norms if you knew what they were back then. Then you can see where like all right I can, I can understand where if somebody was telling me he's gay, then I can understand where that's, they're coming from. First time I write it, I had no idea. You know, like it, it gets like there's one like obvious line from Stannis that you know came out after you found out that Renly did not bet his wife, and that's like the time where it's like oh. But the whole book previous to that, I had, like, no idea. So. (sighs) 
See, but that's okay. Like, having the clarification to the show or the... Thank you. God damn it, cat. Stop being a cat. Like, the clarification of, of information in a new medium, I feel, is doable and acceptable. Mm -hmm. So, like, having a scene where this character is gay in the TV show, just kind of confirming what's already in the work, as opposed to, uh, I, I've decided six months after its publication that this character is something else. Yeah. George has never done that. Yeah. Yeah, like, definitely two different ways to do that. Yeah. Um... I think that about is all the time that we have for tonight, right? Yeah, yeah, then, pretty much. Yeah, I, I ending... don't know if, unless you have anything to add about about bullshit genres uh, or this fucking asshole cat. Just, just tearing off this magazine. Um, That's my boy. <laughs> I mean, there's 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 a lot of the thing that's been irking me a lot is that I've been seeing a lot of magical mm. realism that's not <laughs> magical realism oh. especially because magical realism is a genre that is rooted in latinx culture mm -hmm. and there's a lot of non-latinx people specifically white writers who keep thinking that they're able to do this thing justice and they're not especially because they they think just because they can uh put in some some you know plot inconsistencies and call it magic and that could, that'll make it you know magical realism is just <laughs> a cat um it's, it's it's bothersome and it's it's incredibly disrespectful to latinx writers yes i think uh, another thing with magical realism mm -hmm. and how many people are just like uh god i like she throws a penny in the well and the wish happens. Mm. Like it's magical realism. Like no, mm. no, that's that's more serendipity. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that they they understand magical realism as a literary art, right? Mm -hmm. So like it, there is a history of it not only in the Latinx, but most of its literary or origins mm -hmm. are part of Latinx culture. But there is a cat in a bag of Kit Kats. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lock you in that damn bag. Kit Kat Kat. Uh, but there is a, a history of it in drawings and paintings and Renaissance mm -hmm. art where you know you have these hyper realistic portrayals of unicorns and fairies and satyrs and, and using dicks on staffs. Oh, so many dicks! And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dicks are magical realism. Dicks are magical realism. Title of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, that one's for you, Davis. Yeah, that's for you, Davis. <laughs> uh, but no, that's a that, that's where like you're trying to take this one medium and bring it into this, and you're not doing it well because, I mean, especially for for white culture, like yes, we have fairy tales, but they're like fairy tales. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot that you. I mean, there's totally a lot that you can bring into it, but so many people are hung up on, like, what is magic and what makes it magic? Mm -hmm. And if it's magic in a real setting, then it's magical realism. No. No, that's, that's urban fantasy. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> urban fantasy. Like, mm -hmm. that's a thing. That's where magic is real. This is where you're taking magical elements and explaining them in realistic terms. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that people really understand mm -hmm. that. I did, I, what was I reading recently? The Beholder um, comes out soon or came out, comes out soon as of recording this. But she's taking fairy tale characters and making them actual historic characters mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In, in the world that she's building. And she's taking away their magical elements. So like Hansel and Gretel still get lost, mm -hmm. but they don't find a magical candy house. Um, Homer is on the boat with her, but he didn't go find sirens and and Cyclops right. and and all these other. Well, that's Odysseus. Um, <clears throat> but they're painted as history. Mm -hmm. History is real. History is concrete, quote unquote. Mm. Uh, and that's what you're looking for: these magical elements to come into this, yeah, and not circumstance. Yeah. But I think because I know very few Latinx, <laughs> uh, like, fairy tales. But of the ones that I do know, a lot of them are similar to, like, Don't Follow Strangers. Mm. Uh, and that's very 
that's very simple to bring into a realistic setting as opposed to don't get kicked out of your house mm. don't, when you're 10. <laughs> But if Fun you do, fact, Pokemon is now a fairy tale. Yeah, Pokemon's a fairy tale. Like, but if you do get kicked out, make sure you have bread or something in your pockets. Like, it. I think the lessons in the culture mm -hmm. speak really loudly to being able to understand that outside of that culture. Right, right. But I want more magical realism, and I definitely want more real magical realism. Yeah, real magical <laughs> realism. But I definitely want more. So like. It's not magical realism, but Zoraida Cordova's books. Mm -hmm. I really love her books and how the language and the culture comes through on those. Mm -hmm. And I love them because I'm not Latinx. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's something new. It's immediately a new twist on something old. And it it kind of makes it more vibrant. Like, um, who else? Who else? Tomi Adeyemi's mm -hmm. books. Mm -hmm. You know, while we had a lot of problem with the, the plot, I'm talking like into my cuff. I can hear myself echoing in it. Um, <laughs> While we had some issues with the plot, the world building was really great. And mm -hmm. because it was new to us, right? Mm -hmm. So this is still a high fantasy world, but it's not its not our typical high fantasy yeah. medieval setting. So yeah. it immediately became something like, I have to have that and I have to read that. And it's so much more interesting than... I'm just tired of... Jerky. English medieval fantasy. Yes. I'm tired of Tolkien-esque fantasy yes yeah i I'm also tired of the idea that you have to read the forebears of, of fantasy when most of those forebears are you know white men uh now i'm done i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna pass on that <laughs> read the actual forebears and you know the the the, cur the current um queens of fantasy well first off yes queens of fantasy right <laughs> uh queens of ya in general there's actually like i there's not a lot of male authors mm. in YA. But yet it's the male ones who get the most attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> Booked all night in the goddamn patriarchy. Is that the new title? That's the new title of the oh, podcast. Man, I was really hoping for Dick Spears. <laughs> Dick Spears. I was really hoping for Dick Spears. <laughs> Next title of the thing. podcast. <laughs> we already had Dick Soap. We're moving on to Dick oh, Weapons. Oh, not the Dick Soap. Oh my god. No, I, I, another thing. Oh so boy. I was I, I listened to the Print Run podcast with uh, Laura Zatz and Eric Haynes. Yes. And lovely people. They are lovely people. I love listening to them. They're so funny. Mm -hmm. Uh but I was actually they they were they had a, a Tulun It May Concern, which mm -hmm. is their like advice column part. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about where's the millennial voice of the generation mm -hmm. and Laura's immediate reaction is like most of us are still like in our early 30s give us a fucking break <laughs> second off but there's there's not mm -hmm. like if you had to say there's one author that absolutely captures the millennial experience my first thought is 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 Angie Thomas so it's mine actually yeah uh which is sad Sad in that it has to be the voice of our generation of, you know, black kids getting murdered. Yes. Um, that's that. Yes. To be clear, that is the part that I find <laughs> sad. Um, but Andy there's Thomas deserves every single great thing that she has come in for her. Yes. Uh, it, I love her books. It's just weird because like if, if somebody had asked me when I was a teen, like who was the author that absolutely was my voice and stop getting stop <laughs> being a cat but if somebody had asked me then like who who would you say is is your voice mm. i i probably have like a list and they would all be male authors mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. every single one mm -hmm. uh and now i can't like so angie thomas absolutely yeah and then i can't really think of like I mean, I can think of many other authors. Yeah, just not... But I don't know who I would say is, like, e even even outside of a contemporary genre, I don't know who I would say is, like, the fantasy voice of my generation or the sci-fi voice of my generation or, like, just someone who, if, if you were looking for the definitive 2019 X novel, mm -hmm. who would it be? And at the same time, I'm, like, really happy that I can't pinpoint that down because it means that, like... We have a lot of great voices already. We do. You know, like, Sabata right. here, especially... Oh, my God, I love her work. Like, mm -hmm. even even her name is a fucking work of art. It's not fair. I just... <laughs> I 
like I I think a part of it is that there's a lot of people that are expecting another J.K. Rowling. Yes. Because that's what everyone keeps trying to be billed as, the next J.K. Rowling. Because she was a voice for a generation when we were growing up. Mm-hmm. But it's not... It's 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 a one in a trillion chance to be able to be what she was. Yep. And it's disheartening and also, you know... Aggravating. Aggravating, but also, like, grounding... That that's not going to, you know, happen necessarily again. Because part of it is like, oh, you really want that, you know, superstar, rock star writer. Mm -hmm. But that's not, you know, we don't have that anymore. One, because of the technology, I think. I think you're more likely to find the superstar YouTube channel or the superstar Instagram you know uh, twitch streamer twitch streamer whatever you're it's it's and even then there are many of them now uh, mm-hmm. thinking of instagram how many influencers are thinking motivator for some <laughs> yeah motivating you to buy their products not, not one person <laughs> i follow on instagram is motivating <laughs> i can assure you That's because you only follow your friends and all of your friends are as lazy as you bingo <laughs> That's not true. I follow I follow a lot of dog accounts. That's true. Um, they're, they're motivated. They're motivated. I'm not. Uh, but you know, there there are these accounts that have four and five million followers, or they mm-hmm. have like twenty million followers. Yeah. So, what the same scale? So, like, if Harry Potter came out now mm-hmm. on the same scale, it would have to be ten times bigger than what it was when it first came out, mm-hmm. which is rightly insane Mm -hmm. you are correct Mm -hmm. uh but i wonder like is there a way to use that technology george Hmm? (laughs) (laughs) i mean there's part of i think i think part of the reason that harry potter one got huge not just because of its literary impact Mm -hmm. and how it changed the field of children's literature as a whole but also because kids back then we didn't have cell phones in our pockets we didn't have access to a kindle with hundreds and you know thousands of books at our fingertips we didn't you know we didn't have switches and xboxes and laptops and tablets we can take with us for entertainment and other avenues and other media but also we all we weren't looking to consume for a number looking at you goodreads challenge Mm -hmm. now you're right you're right i think i think another thing with harry potter that will just constantly come up on the podcast Mm -hmm. because it's harry potter Mm -hmm. but (laughs) there was an article i read many years ago oh my god like 2012 that hurts (laughs) it hurts me right in my old but uh i believe it was on the leaky cauldron the the fan site yes and it was all about what really made Harry Potter appealing because it was appealing to all sorts of readers. And mm-hmm. this kind of comes back around to loop into my genres of fiction discussion where it, it was fantasy, mm-hmm. but it was also action and adventure and mystery. And there were sports and there was romance and there was friendship and mm-hmm. there was school. And there was a, like a little bit of sci-fi, if you want to count potions and like some of the magical technology in there. Mm-hmm. There were so many genres to get you into it Mm -hmm. and to hook you into it. That's, you know, that's from a craft aspect as well. But I think part of it is also, this was the first children's book that was not written down towards children. Yes. It was not an adult character looking back on their childhood. It was a, a child character we got to grow up with. Yes. Which I think is partially why it appealed to, to a lot of children. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, Harry Potter is the reason a lot of people are readers. Yes. Um, having having read a lot of older mm-hmm. <laughs> children's books, so when after Harry Potter, ha ha ha, the next book I went to go read was actually Half Magic, mm-hmm. and I loved it. Mm-hmm. But it was a different reading experience than what I had with Harry Potter. Again, because of what you're saying, where they're, you're writing down to them, which mm-hmm. I still feel happens today, where people are like, I want to write for kids. And they look at it like a genre rather than an age category. Mm-hmm. Like, 
seven-year-olds are still smart people and mm -hmm. you don't have to explain everything to them. And if you had read Lemony Snicket's books, you would realize how obnoxious it is mm -hmm. to constantly be told what things mean. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think so many adults come to children's literature with it'll be easier and I'll just mm -hmm. write these simple sentences. And mm -hmm. it's like, you understand those simple sentences are what make bad writers and bad readers. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we don't even speak in simple sentences. We speak in complex sentences. If we were going to punctuate what I'm saying, there'd be a whole shit ton of semicolons everywhere because mm -hmm. everything's related. And, and M dashes. It, oh, so many M dashes. I love M -dashes. I'm, I'm all, I'm all about M dashes. <laughs> <laughs> They've been replaced by claps on Twitter. I love it. But I, I think that's something that people are still understanding today mm -hmm. about what makes children's literature appealing. I think they know what it is in adult fiction and mm -hmm. it's literary fiction and fuck you, fuck literary fiction. <laughs> <laughs> literary fiction always reminds me of uh, Heart of Darkness. Uh, where nothing happens twice. Where nothing happens twice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it just... Like, I, I, I want there to be a point. I want there to be some action. I definitely want something to explode. Like, the sun. I want to take the sun out. I know, Jessica. You like exploding things. I like exploding. I like the boom boom. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, I like making everybody gay. Yeah. And, like, yeah. but there there should be something for everyone. Can you, like, can you imagine a whole novel where all that happens is, like, the kid comes out. There's no, there's no existential dread about it. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no question. It or, wouldn't be a story. It'd be a one page and just a sheet. Just saying, hey, by the way, by I'm, I'm gay. gay. <laughs> <laughs> the end. New York Times bestselling sheet <laughs> of paper <laughs> by John Green. <laughs> by probably by John Green is right. Yeah, like <sighs> I, especially in children's fiction, mm -hmm. there is a lot where nothing happens mm -hmm. and then another book comes out to kind of make up for the fact that nothing happened mm -hmm. and i think no i know especially in in kid lit things that go up on middle grade hardback new mm -hmm. york times bestsellers list are going through three gatekeepers and those gatekeepers are the ones that are making sure that it goes up onto that list mm -hmm. where teens have their own money and their own say mm, more, or for, less. more or less you know more so than an eight-year-old yes you know you have your teacher your librarian and your parents saying mm -hmm. okay this book is acceptable for you to read this book is not for you to read like like there's i mean speaking as a librarian's assistant someone who works in the library specifically a children's department mm -hmm. a lot of what our core mission is is to make more kids better readers like mm -hmm. there is uh there's one girl who comes in she is in fourth or fifth grade i don't remember uh she only reads level one chapter books like beginning readers like see spot run and it's it's disheartening because she's a smart kid she could absolutely be reading something you know Part of that also more complex, and it part of that I think comes from either her hesitancy to, to read up, or her somebody being like you shouldn't be reading this. As a as a late blooming reader, it is probably that second one mm -hmm. that you shouldn't be reading this. This is too big mm -hmm. for you, mm -hmm. and you you really start to internalize that and be like, okay, mm -hmm. it's too big for me, and it'll always be too big for me. And That's why I've never read Anne of Green Gables. I was in second or third grade when I got. You're not uh, missing much. I know. <laughs> well, I was in second or third grade when I got a copy of it, and everyone was like, maybe read that when you're older. And I'm just like, all right, maybe I'm just never going to be old enough for it. Yeah. And, but, and like, like, it's the same thing happens, not just like specifically with graphic novels as well. A lot of parents are like, that's not real reading. Uh, fuck but you like, guys. But there's so much. I have this one really sweet kid who comes in for homework help and I love him a lot. He's so sweet. He exclusively loves to read Dogman comics. <laughs> he just loves Dogman. And he, it's just what he reads. But those things are like, you know, an inch thick. They're big books. Um, and he just loves them and he wouldn't be reading anything else otherwise. Um, I think especially for graphic novels, so many people look down on them, but it's like, number one, a lot of fucking work goes into those. Mm -hmm. And number two, a lot of work goes into reading them because you have to, 
uh, you have to connect not just on a textual level, but a visual level as well. Yes. And there's so much like not being said in the words that's being said in the picture that you have to be able to comprehend. Yes. Mm -hmm. But so many people think of them like picture books. Mm -hmm. And so like in a picture book, the picture is complemental mm -hmm. to the work, right? We're, we're filling in a few blanks, like the color of the ball mm -hmm. or the type of dog, like, mm -hmm. and it, it goes with that. But in graphic novel, it's, it's all supplemental. It's mm -hmm. its own thing. There mm -hmm. are things in the background you should be looking for. Mm -hmm. There are things in the foreground. There's mm -hmm. facial expressions mm -hmm. that might not come across through what the character is saying. And, and you're right. Like there's, there's two places to connect on that. But so many people are looking at the medium and they're like, well, that's for kids. Like, well, for starters, a child. <laughs> and secondly, like, if a child is reading, outside of the girl who's clearly reading below her level, mm. be happy that they're reading. Mm -hmm. And be like, okay, I see that you like graphic novels. Here's one at a higher lexile level. Mm -hmm. Rather than, no, graphic novels are bad. Mm -hmm. Or, I see you're reading, like, the level one and two lexile level I can read now books. Why don't mm -hmm. we try one at a level four? Mm -hmm. Like, and just kind of moving them up rather than degrading them yeah. for reading something that they're comfortable with. Yeah. Like there was really funny. This kid came in, I think it was Thursday night or Wednesday night. I don't remember. He came in and he was like, where are your books for like third graders? And they're like, Oh, are you in third grade? He's like, no, I'm in second, but I can read better. <laughs> it, was really it, was just, it was so funny. Uh, he he tore through all of the the upper level uh, reader books and chapter books. It was very cute. Um, yeah, but that's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. It's great. Uh, anything to get the kids away from the computers is is what we're trying to do with with books, especially in the library. Like, there's a lot of things that you can have on the computer, but there's only so much that you should be able to do on the computer in terms of like all right so 90 percent of the kids who come into the library they go straight to the computers mm -hmm. they all play roblox which is like a minecraft Fortnite thing i don't understand it i don't <laughs> pretend to understand you're, it you're too old for roblox i get uh, it yeah uh, <laughs> i just you know it's they like to do that they like to play that they whatever um but they're there all day long it was spring break this past week Kids came in at 9 in the morning. They left at 8 o'clock at night, an hour before it closed, or 7 o'clock at night or whatever. They would leave for food and come back. And they would just sit at the computers all day. And we have to be like, hey, like, be as energetic as possible the same way that you have to be energetic to get Luca or Belle to go over the A-frame uh, or into the tunnel. And we have to be like, hey, who wants to come and make uh, an umbrella craft? Or who wants to paint rocks? Or who wants to do literally anything else? And part of it is, like, we want them to read. And part of them is we want them to experience stories outside of what you know, they're used to getting from a screen. Mm -hmm. And I'm not degrading other mediums. I'm not degrading, you know, technology and computer. And I can see in your face <laughs> that you want to, you know, you want to say something. But I'm, I, I, I see the merits of the computer. I see the merits of technology. But there has to be a line. Especially when kids are so young that they're still developing. Mm -hmm. Uh like, I'm not, I'm not saying computers and screens are bad, <laughs> technology's the devil. Kids, okay. when they were my age, they went outside and played with sticks <laughs> and read books. In the snow. In the snow up the hill both ways. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I see your point. Yeah. That, you know, there's a lot of time doing skills that are not going to be real world skills. Mm -hmm. But there has to be, like, even as a librarian, you're still, especially while you're there and these mm -hmm. kids are there, you're in an educator role. And there has to be a point where the educator steps down off the pedestal and comes to say, how can I use this medium that mm -hmm. they are clearly so interested in and bring mm -hmm. it into the classroom? So, like, Roblox especially, mm -hmm. because it's like Minecraft and they can build their own worlds, ask them to make a diorama of a scene that they read in a book. Mm -hmm. Like, just do anything that brings them to you mm -hmm. or coming to this line rather than like hey you have to put away things that you're clearly interested in because e even even that even saying like there has to be a line there has to be this time like no there doesn't mm -hmm. you know you, you there has to be a connection because otherwise we're getting to the point where like mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell but mm -hmm. i don't know how to do my taxes right so it while while I can't make the argument that like Roblox is giving them real world life skills, <laughs> um, find find a way that it is. 
find yeah, find a way that like even mobile games mm-hmm. are are doing something you know find a way that instagram can be relevant in the classroom find a way that you you can bring them to what you want them to get to without having to say that's not acceptable right and i'm not trying to say that's not acceptable like i mean i am 100 percent in the same boat where i will spend 100 percent of my time on the computer hypocrite <laughs> <laughs> But part of it comes from, one, as my job as uh, an assistant there, Mm -hmm. you know, working in the library, it's part of my job to try to get them to be engaged in anything and everything, because while the computers are great, the books is still what the core of the library is, and the community is part of, you know, the core of the library, Mm -hmm. Um, and we're trying to foster that connection. We can't do that if they're sitting at a screen and not talking to... Well, sometimes they talk to each other. They're mostly <laughs> yelling at each other and calling each other putas. But uh, it's, it's a very Hispanic community, <laughs> and they think we don't understand when they curse in Spanish. Um, it's great. But it's it, it's also partially me wanting to share my love of books with you know the next generation, partially because I found so much joy in the books and that I want them to find so much joy in the books. Well, there's also books about their video games, and I don't just mean like the production of. Yeah. There's there's Roblox the novel. Yeah. Like, hand it over and be like, hey, somebody else needs computer time, but mm-hmm. if you're still interested, here's this. Mm-hmm. Like, so that it shows that you're still listening and seeing yeah. what they're interested in, rather mm-hmm. than like, hey, come make a kite. <laughs> 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 you know, like mm-hmm. it it doesn't have to be that far off the medium. Right. And just yeah. Uh, I think we've been rambling on for way too goddamn long, uh, mostly because I'm starving. <laughs> uh, well, that's all the time that we have. So tune in next time for an interview with uh, Rebecca Donnelly, the author of The Friendship Lie, Cats Are Liquid, and How to Stage a Catastrophe. Uh, just look at my life. <laughs> <laughs> Check out the links in the show notes to follow the show or connect with us personally on Facebook and Twitter. And don't forget to visit bookedallnight.blog for more book reviews, blog tours, and roundups. Whether you're listening on Spotify, iTunes, or Google Podcasts, make sure you drop a five-star review of the show. Good night, my little dick spears. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what's the noun going to be? What is it going to be? It's going to be Dick Spears. Yep. Thank you so much, Maggie. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, my God. Good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Dick Spears. Son of a bitch. <laughs> Dick Spears.